people are trickling. I'm sure other people will join us, but let's let's start. Um, so to say, my name is Bea Lefkowitz. I'm the director of Safadi Voices UK, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our interview with Libyan-born Raphael Luzon. I hope you had a good Pesach, everyone. And just to say, we are recording this evening's event. So if you don't want to be seen, please um, switch the camera off. Um, you will be all muted during the interview, but we have time for questions at the end. You can raise your hand uh, and we will unmute you, or you can put the question in the chat. Also to say, uh, we are still interviewing. We are interviewing on Zoom, but soon we are hoping to get back to uh, to proper interviews, one-to-one uh, -one interviews. So if you know anyone who would like to be interviewed and give testimony for Safari Voices UK, please contact us. We had to postpone this event to, de to today, to the eve of Yom HaShoah. And it seems that it's a very good day to talk about Raphael's story and the story of the Jews of Libya. It's important to remind ourselves that the Holocaust did not only affect Ashkenazi Jews, but also Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews in the Balkans, like in Yugoslavia, Greece, and Romania, in North Africa, and in Iraq. In Salonika, the city which is very close to my heart, 96% of the Jewish population was killed. When we founded Sephardi Voices UK 10 years ago, it was our aim to capture and preserve the forgotten histories of the Jews from the Middle East, North Africa, and Iran. On the eve of Yom HaShoah, we particularly remember the forgotten histories of the individuals and the families whose lives were affected by the Shoah. Recently, the category of Holocaust victims in Israel has been expanded to Holocaust survivors and victims of anti-Semitism during the Holocaust. The journalist Arut Shiva, in an article published today, speaks about the fact that there are 174,500 people in Israel today who fall under these two categories. Now, what is interesting is if you look at the breakdown, how he breaks down the, this, this, group of, this group, he says 32% of this groups originated from Morocco and Algeria, where they lived under the anti-Nazi, under the anti-Jewish laws by the French Vichy regime. 11% came from Tunisia and Libya, who suffered under the racial purity laws imposed on them and who were sent to forced labor camps, in some instances to Bergen-Belsen. And another 11% came from Iraq and had suffered most notably under the Fahud pogrom carried out in June 1941. The situation of the Jews in Libya during the Second World War was complex and Jews were treated differently according to which citizenship they had. Jews with French citizenship were sent to concentration camps in Algeria and Tunisia. Jews with British citizenship were sent to concentration camps in Europe, first Italy, and then post-1943 to Bergen-Belsen. Jews holding Libyan citizenships were sent to concentration camps in Tripolitania. The most famous one was Giado. Although Rafael Luzon was born after the war in 1954, I'm sure he will tell us more about the very interesting history of the Jews of Libya and his own life. I will now hand you over to Daisy Aboudi, our Deputy Director of Safadi Voices UK and founder of Tales of Jewish Sudan. Thank you. Thank you, Bea. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, oh, I'm really sorry. I just need to, because of the recording. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank Raphael very much for agreeing to uh, take part in this event for us. Um, as Bea mentioned, Rafael was born in Libya. He grew up in Benghazi and he left in 1967. Um, he's had a very interesting career in interfaith relations since then. Um, and we're going to start just by talking a little bit about the um, war periods before uh, you were born. Um, during the war in Libya, the fate of each Jewish family was determined by which passport they held. Um, what nationality was your family and how did that affect their experience? My family had, uh, as the other Jews of Libya, a sort of no nationality. And then in 51, 1951, when Libya got independence, uh, 
many Jews uh, have the British passport or uh, Italian passport or French passport. Uh, few of them I uh, know that I have also Maltese passport. Our family, one of the few that uh, get uh, the Libyan the royal passport. And this is uh, make us, made us, uh, not my family, but all these people that uh, receive the Libyan official royal passport a sort of elite. Uh, there is no reason, no protection, no friends of friends. There is no logic. Uh, they choose some families and they decide to give them uh, the uh, uh, Libyan passport. Therefore, we had the uh, royal passport until uh, uh, 69. And when we expired in 69, in the meantime, Gaddafi came to power. Uh, he refused, of course, to renew it. And I'm holding this uh, passport until today. And every time I'm going to meet uh, high class uh, Libyans or officials or ministers, I take out this passport and uh, waving it in front of his face, their face, to say that uh, uh, in any case, uh, call it a revolution, call it the Arab uh, Spring, but it's still uh, only bloody dictatorship because countries that refuse to give citizenship and passport to their own uh, citizen born in this country is only, I have one word to define, racism. Therefore, uh, the Jews, the family that had the British nationality, French nationality, Tunisian nationality, and the Maltese nationality, uh, perhaps they come from the, the, the origin because the Libyan Jewry is divided by three um, uh, roots. The first one was uh, the Jews came after the first destruction, the first temple, between the first and the second temple, uh, in, settled in, uh, in, the, in the area near Benghazi, uh, in a place called Derna, and uh, El Marge, that in Italian has been called Marche. And, uh, and in Libya, there were only Jews and Berbers, Amazir. And uh, the, uh, this relationship with the Amazir was very so strong that uh, our, our conclusion arrived in, uh, in a sort of a unification of the two groups. And uh, until today, when the Libyan, the Arab Libyan, want to offend the, the Berbers, they call them Jews. And uh, uh, we had also a, so, uh, a common queen, Jew, Kaina, uh, that uh, became the, the queen of the this United Tribes. And that's the very during, during the Second World War, though, your family, you said they didn't have a citizenship. No, without this. So, how did the, in 1938 the racial laws were passed in Libya by the Italian government? How did they affect your family? The fact that they didn't my have family, a... every family. My, uh, my father, until a uh, few months before he passed away, his main hobby was to go to the, his bank and to challenge the people there, working there, telling them, you use the, your computer, I use my head, and he was always willing. Why I'm telling this? Because he was forced to leave the schools at the third class. After the third class, he was uh, uh, half, half analphabet, and my mother the same, and we were forced to go to work, the, the, the males and the females, back to home to help the mother. So I felt every one of us, every one of the family, uh, they were thrown up from the schools. There were a very known uh, lawyer, uh, Joseph Habib, from Benghazi, that afterward he um, uh, went to Tripoli. You can imagine, he was so bright that he was has been nominated as a, a legal uh, advisor of the Muhabarat in Libya. Uh, and these people, started, he became a lawyer because he studied privately by himself at home and went to make the exam in, in Italy. Uh, so, what tell them effect. On the other hand, he developed more, the not directly, the sort of, uh, the sense of commerce of the Libyan people, as you know, uh, as, as every Jew from Arab country has a, a sense of commerce and economic and finance, but the, mainly the Libyan, especially the people from Tripoli, that were, have much more, more, more uh, population, they are um, a good, uh, what they call the good commercial. So this is, was the effect. But another effect, terrible, 
because in, sometimes in the same family, there were two kinds of passports. Therefore, family has been divided. Part of the family has been sent to Egypt, like uh, one of my uncles, the Rabbi uh, Lavi, and uh, my mother with some part of her sister and brothers has been uh, sent to Tunisia because it was a friend uh, Monday. And uh, tragic as tragic, uh, they uh, were happy to leave Libya uh, with all the Nazis and fascists are there. But once arrived in Tunisia, the Allied forces bombed Tunis, Tunis and in one Black Sabbath, Black Saturday, uh, the Jewish community were, were all gathering because of the uh, praying together for Shabbat. And they, they bombed exactly with this uh, mass of people that thought that are my demonstration. And my mother, in one minute, lost her mother, uh, sister, two brothers, and uh, the third brother had been mutilated. He left. Uh, he lost his uh, his arm. So uh, this div division was terrible for everyone of us. Uh, them. And then they would come back in 45, 46, back to Libya. They start. Uh, uh, the majority prepared themselves to make the, the, the big aliyah that was between 48 and 51. And your, um, you, you mentioned that after you were obviously born um, in 54 and by then, as you said, a few, quite a lot of the community had already left. Um, how did the impact of World War II and, and you know, some Jews were deported and, and all of this. How did that affect you? And were you taught about it? Were you told about it? What did you know growing up about that period? I tell you the truth, I have, I have a problem uh, because of, I noticed this problem, I discovered this problem only after we have been thrown out of Libya. And I would like to correct you. I didn't leave Libya. They threw me out from Libya. Yeah. They expelled me. And uh, in Benghazi and Tripoli, there were two different realities. Benghazi was only few Jews. Let's say the, um, the top was in the 1450s that they raised 8,000 people. Where Tripoli, there were 32,000 people uh, in Tripoli. And uh, the majority went on Aliyah. Uh, so from 51, the independence of Libya, until 67, the the June 67, that was the big pogrom, last one, um, after the Sixth Day War. We were nearly 6,000 people in, uh, in Tripoli and uh, exactly 223 in Benghazi. Despite this number, they were a very well organized community with Rabbanim, with Bedin, with Shokhatim, with Mualim, with, uh, in Tripoli we left in 67, 37 synagogues. From these 37 synagogues, at least 25 were active daily. Shachrit, Mincha, Arvit. And during the, the big holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Ekipur, uh, they also used to open also private temporary synagogues because uh, everyone was religious and, and going to, to pray. And um, therefore, what, what, uh, what uh, happened is they immediately after the independence, they had this big luck, the Libyans, discovered the oil and uh, there were a sort of economical and financial boom that the, the Jews uh, enjoyed. And uh, if you ask people of Benghazi, they will tell you that the, these 15 years were the best 15 years of Libya and also of the Libyan Jewry in Benghazi. Tripoli also the same, but because of the number, because of the uh, Tripoli people are, were much more modern, much less Arabic, Arabs than the Benghazi people, so they uh, um, emphasize more the, the, the way of life. They were used to go to the, to the beach and to the casino. There were a casino there and um, dancing. So they were um, uh, aims of uh, attacks from the young Arabs, the Shabab, you know, that uh, using to, to touch the woman in the street or to disturb someone praying in the Mutra. Uh, therefore, if you ask a, a, a Jew from Tripoli, they will tell you that, uh, yes, we lived very well the 15, 16 years uh, until uh, the power of 67, but di very disturbed. If you ask Jews from Benghazi, they will tell you that, well, I'm, I'm defined this 15 years, the best 15 years of my life till today. 
uh, they were, uh, we were used to live uh, in a very strong and, and uh, united community. They used to be very uh, friendly with each other, like a big family of 250 people. And uh, the holidays, the Chagim, the Shabbatot, um, every, 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 not only bar mitzvah or wedding, but every, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, birthday was a, 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 an occasion to gather the whole Kaila with the, including the rabbis, including everyone. So I have very, very, very good, uh, very good uh, reminders from, from Libya. But I can understand that uh, in Tripoli was a bit different. Therefore, uh, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not hiding the thing that I have, uh, especially the last eight years, uh, daily battles with uh, Arabs. No, with my Jews, with my Jews that say to me that I'm dreamer, that you wish I should not um, uh, have trust the Arabs more. And I, my answer is always not uh, every Jew is the Lamedwav, not every Arab is Bin Laden. We'll come back to that a little bit more, but I want to ask you first, was there anything specific Libyan? You mentioned the community was very uh, observant, they were at synagogue and um, what, can you give us an example of some specific Libyan Jewish? Uh, this is all, uh, the, the specific Libyan uh, Jewry thing that uh, came in my mind is a wedding. Uh, the wedding, uh, all Arab, uh, Jews from Arab countries, but the wedding in Libya is start the first day and the end of the eighth or seven days. Uh, seven days that every evening uh, there is a sort of program. The first day, I, I'm not going down chronologically, but uh, one day is for the, uh, let's say, the, the friends of the, the groom and then another day for the friends of the bride and, uh, and then the henna, that uh, there are special ceremony that the the groom has put the henna on the hair and uh, with a lot of uh, dancing and music and very special uh, sweets and uh, there is the day of the mikveh the, i mean that seven days that each one uh, when you say when we say we read sometimes that the, my wedding is the, the more one of the more important days of my life if you do it in Libya, yes. I don't know what is the important day of your life doing it in Europe. But uh, this is remind me that uh, when uh, someone declared that he's going to be married, the whole community got excited and everyone ran to, to, to buy clothes and the thing because we know that we are going to, uh, to face not less than one week of uh, madness, uh, Rio de Janeiro. And, uh, but, uh, Another thing that came back to my, um, uh, uh, that I have a big nostalgia about this, is the big uh, holidays, especially Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, and Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah, the Libyan Jews invented something, the, uh, the Kafot Shniot, you know, the, the second Kafot, that is not invented by Libyan, but the Libyan invented to do it with dawn. I mean, um, the second day of Simchat Torah, because then the, as you know, outside Israel, we are certified two days, the second day of, of, of Simchat Torah, the Libyan Jewry, all the community used to wake up very early in the morning, like four in the morning, and going still night, going to the synagogue, uh, where the woman bringing all what you can imagine between food and uh, bakery and uh, cafe, special coffee with the uh, zahar, with, you know, the fruit uh, blossom of orange and uh, very oriental things. And we stayed there in the synagogue until 12, Mid, mid uh, midday, and this is was getting the especially the youngs and the children very excited because it was a, a sort of a huge festival of uh, uh, sweets and uh, dancing and uh, uh, these two things uh, uh, are uh, coming on my memory. And the third thing that I would like I wanted to fulfill uh, forty years after when uh, Gaddafi invited me to come to Libya to visit, uh, he asked me to send him a list of places that I wish to, to visit. Yeah, I put uh, in one, uh, one of the name of the list, the beach. So I think they, they didn't understand what I'm talk, talking about. And when we arrived to the beach, I started going close, I would prepare myself, of course, before, and I said to the one of the bodyguards uh, to, uh, to hold my video camera and to film. So he didn't understand, he wanted me 
do you want me to film you really close to the water? I told him, yes. When I arrived to the water, just took off, like Clark Kent and, uh, and Superman, I took off all my dresses and I went into the, the sea and the, the bodyguards just start panicking. And this is why, because I wanted to re, to re, re embrace the same sea that I was there every single day, uh, except the two, three months of the, of the winter. And what about the relationships between the Jewish community and other people living in Libya, both uh, Libyan Arabs, Italians? What was what was the intercommunity relationships like? Uh, again, I, I cannot talk about Tripoli or especially especially about Benghazi. Uh, I'm I'm usually saying that uh, the uh, the behavior of the Arabs depends how the Jews behave. With, Toward them. Uh, if you look to the Arab at the same, the same level of eyes, uh, they like this uh, consideration and they answer you back in the same way. The Jews from Benghazi sp spoke a very good Arabic, Libyan Arabic, and uh, because the Jews of Tripoli spoke mainly Italian, even in, in family, uh, spoke Arabic, but, but especially in Italian. But the Benghazi, we spoke in, in Arabic. Many of our people went to university. Uh, until today, they are talking, as, uh, re reading, writing uh, special Arabic. And therefore, uh, the relationship was quite, let's say, mutual respect. Well, sometimes happened that uh, some of the pe people um, disturbing or throwing stones. So we sorted out in a way like Adun Ayal, Adun Ayal, that's the only people, there are only youngest, don't worry. They never give importance to someone that also in, in another place of the world would have been called or defined anti-Semitic attack. So sometimes they attack people coming out from the synagogue, especially during maybe a big uh, festival, but instead of the calling anti-Semitic attack and going to the police, the sheikh of the, of the, of the street uh, came to the, to the Jew, and attacked and uh, made a sort of, uh, what they call it, sulha, and uh, let's uh, drink together. And, uh, to, uh, and uh, sometimes they force the, the young that throw the stone to, to ask uh, forgiveness from the Jew. I remember several episodes of this in, in my house. And so uh, the, the relationship became very, very bad from 1965 because and the university, the Libyan university became very strong, the Nasserian movement. Uh, and uh, they start doing uh, something that never we saw before, the demonstration against uh, Israel and against the Jew. Uh, and this kind of demonstration happened exactly the 5th of June, 67, where we thought is this the usual demonstration, but very early became uh, the, the starting of a big pogrom where all the Jews, uh, all the Jews, uh, and, and nobody excluded uh, the Jews uh, shops has been burned. Part of the houses has been burned. People uh, beat. And in Tripoli, 17 people has been killed. Uh, eight of them uh, by family, by uh, bro my father, brother, my uncle, his uh, wife and six uh, children. The youngest one was two years old and the eldest one was uh, 17 years old. And uh, I managed uh, after 40 years to find when I've been in Tripoli to find the place that is a common grave that they've been uh, uh, put there. And uh, I asked for Gaddafi to have the permission to bring some 10 people to make a, a religious ceremony. And he asked me positively, say, uh, 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 you can do whatever you want, but don't bring here people with uh, Israeli passport. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately, it happened uh, this, uh, call it, so named revolution, and we are back to square one. But uh, Baruch Hashem, I can tell you that uh, three, three days ago, I had a very, very, or oh, five years ago, I had a very big surprise uh, the, from the 12 candidates to be nominated prime minister in Libya, has been nominated uh, Dbeiba, that is a very, very close friend of mine. Uh, he, he is family, and he personally called me and said that uh, whatever you agree with uh, 
Gaddafi, give us a few time to settle the, the, town, the country, and then we'll uh, invite you again with the delegation to, to sort out a lot of things that are still uh, pending. What was your experience in 1967? Can you talk so, about that? Sandy. What was your experience in 1967? Like everyone, a terrible experience because, uh, again, we were in a place that we hardly heard about Israel. The, the magazines and the uh, newspapers that uh, used to arrive in Libya once a week from Italy mainly uh, usually had uh, uh, some pages cut. So we understood that uh, uh, it contains article about Israel, about Jews. Uh, we was were forbidden, we have to wear only this kind of kippah without uh, Magin David or without any uh, Israeli or, or Zionist symbol uh, on one hand. On the other hand, we use, had the, the freedom to pray uh, whenever we want, whatever we want, and uh, our weddings, our things, everything was free. Uh, and uh, when happened the riots, I think I was in shock for uh, one year because uh, the, uh, I've been uh, one, two, three months before Bar Mitzvah and I, I remember that I started shouting to my father that was everyone crying at home and downstairs a mob uh, tried to to crush the, the door and come out, come up to make a lynch. Uh, I start crying. Why? Why they, they are against us? But I see. I'm seeing between the mob, the people that you yesterday you drink coffee with them, and uh, this is make me uh, shock that I didn't couldn't understand how come a people that one day before was drinking coffee with my father, the day after he was the same one that put the first torch uh, in, uh, in one of his uh, five big stores in Benghazi and uh, lighted off, lighted off. And uh, this for me was terrible. On the other hand, uh, our neighbors was uh, called Haj Ali. Uh, when the mob start going through toward the synagogue, uh, what they call it, the Salal Kibira, he personally, I saw it with my eyes, he personally ran and put his body in front of the, uh, the, the door and say to the, the mob, burn the shops but this is a place of God, you cannot touch it. And he saved the synagogue. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, we are not Ashkenazi, because without being Ashkenazi, this man would have received uh, the the price of a just, uh, you know, the Hasidum Umbut Aulam. But we sleeping sometimes, and uh, people like this, and many of them had some episodes, uh, and also, that they also in, uh, in Tunisia, in Iraq, uh, people, Arab people, saves, Family, entire families brought food while the families in Tripoli were closed in the, in the houses uh, because uh, risking his their life because in Benghazi they took all the community in a, a refugee camp. But in Tripoli, only part of the community, the refugee camp, and the other part was hidden at home. And uh, I know a lot of episodes that um, deserve that these people or, they, or their sons or their children receive a sort of prize from uh, uh, Bitsat Futsot or whatever, or Yad Vashem. And you, the way you, you phrase it, the, the expulsion from Libya, that, can you talk us through what happened there? Because there was a difference between the, the king was kind of helping in a way. A king, uh, also, this is a sort of legend. Uh, a king was not uh, a friend of the Jews, but was not anti-Semitic. He was, a, I mean, an honest person, a very, very, very old when he came to power, uh, very tired because he had on his shoulders something like uh, 30 years of uh, fighting the, uh, the Italian. And um, uh, there's a very famous episode that was, you know, when the, the 65, they start the demonstration, the students attack the police first time. The police shoot and killed two students. And uh, the Libyan were so shocked, the government, that uh, they vote a, a, a law saying that uh, from then uh, the police has no right to shoot in any demonstration uh, except from the direct order of the Minister of Interior 
of the prime minister. And then the, the, the day of the, the riots start, the power on, on 5th of June, the, the, the king was in El Beida, that is uh, 200 kilometers south from Benghazi, that he was his uh, place where he wanted to go to holiday sometimes. And the prime minister ran there, there was no internet or email or something. He ran there, uh, announced, listen, they are slaughtering Jews, they are burning the... So the king asked him, uh, why don't you say to the, the, the army to shoot the demonstrator? So he told them, because uh, there is a law that uh, said that only the minister of interior or the prime minister. So the king has the akaz, the uh, uh, step, the step, you know, uh, he took up the steps and threw it on, until him, to him, and said, and what are you, idiot? You are the prime minister. You could have... Yeah. So he came back running, and only at the three o'clock in the afternoon, when the pogrom started at nine o'clock in the morning, only at the three o'clock afternoon, the special forces of the king came out, collecting the Jews in Benghazi and also passed in Tripoli. And this is a very, very, very known episode. And when uh, the previous the chairman of the Jews of Libya, Rafael of Allah, um, went to meet uh, the king in Cairo, uh, in exile. Uh, the king gave him this, uh, this step uh, as a present, and, uh, uh, and Rafael of Allah took it. And I think that after Rafael of Allah passed away, they passed it to one of the museums uh, in, uh, in Israel. And after leaving Libya, you went to Italy and you've spent a lot of time working in interfaith. When did that begin? When did that start to interest you? This is uh, a very good question. This uh, began exactly when I uh, was six years old. Why? Because the uh, six years old, the uh, first day of school, and I re uh, realized that they are sending me to a Catholic school, born in uh, a Jewish uh, religious family in a Muslim country, the interfaith since start then. Uh, so when I came out from Libya, I couldn't accept that uh, the religious, especially the three monotheistic religions, could be one uh, against the other. I have uh, such a high uh, consideration, it's more than consideration, it's high thinking of uh, what is God, what is the Almighty, that I usually say that is, is too big to be contained only through one religion. Has to, to express itself so that, between other uh, college religions, other way to, 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 to worship him. And uh, I also at school in, uh, in Rome, also university, is other people used to very, very modern to, to act uh, as a political activist. I never acted as a politician, but as a, a man of dialogue. Uh, I always organized, uh, friends of mine know exactly. Also my my birthday, I used to invite uh, Christian, uh, Muslims, uh, uh, Jews, of course. And uh, I never saw myself until today that uh, uh, I'm the last part the last track of my life, uh, I never saw myself only between Jews. Uh, um, until today, I'm very excited when I, I have the opportunity to hear the uh, Muazzin. Uh, when I was uh, living in Benghazi, five times a day, I used to hear this. And when I came back in Libya after 42 years, the first day uh, that I arrived there, I thought to myself, I will, I will sleep a bit because I was, was asleep the, the only, the, the whole week before from the excitement. And suddenly at five o'clock in the morning, so, so, and this Muezzin starts. And uh, other people who were with me start cursing. I said, no, 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 for me it's music. For me it's just re 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 throw me back 42 years. And I like this kind of music. I like the, the church music. And of course, uh, I'm a Hazan, and I'm also bringing the, uh, my knowledge of Farid al Atrash and Abdul Harim Hafez uh, to the, uh, our rights in Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. And uh, you are invited to come either to Tiferet Eyal or to Echaleah, 
to hear me. And uh, I think that uh, not bad. My, my father, Alava Shalom, he was a huge Hazan. A huge Hazan, uh, you can imagine they was calling him to come from Italy to Israel, to Israel, not the opposite, uh, to be a Hazan from the Libyan communities there in Batyam and in uh, uh, Holon and in Natania because he had a huge voice. And unfortunately, not like today, as nowadays, uh, nobody, nobody uh, record him and nobody think, thought to, to, to film him uh, as we now we're recording every uh, piece of cake that we are eating. <laughs> <laughs> and what year did you first go back to Libya? Uh, 2010, and there uh, was uh, absolutely uh, four days that I would never, uh, never forget. I, use, I'm, until today, I have very close uh, relationship with uh, journalists, with politicians, with uh, uh, everyone. I'm what begging and nagging, uh, please uh, call Gaddafi. So one of them told me, "Listen, write a letter. I'm going to Israel, to Libya uh, next week. Let's try." Uh, I was drinking coffee with my wife and suddenly I got a phone call with the journalist that usually when he's calling me, he used to make jokes or something. He was very serious and telling me, I'm in front of Akhal Qaid. I'm in front of the uh, brother leader and he read, uh, read them and he wants you to come in, uh, in Libya, but he's got a condition. You have to bring your mother because he remember that one of your articles, you quote your mother saying, that she used to say, I hope, I pray God, before I close my eyes forever, to see again Libya. And uh, I say, how would that to fulfill, fulfill his, uh, his uh, desire? I told him, listen, she's uh, old, she's uh, sick. He told me, otherwise you won't come. Bring it, I will I promise you, 24 hours I'll have a doctor and uh, a nurse. And this is what happened. We had 24 hours doctor and nurse, 15 uh, bodyguards, and uh, and uh, I was very happy because I managed to fulfill to Gaddafi the, this uh, desire of my mother, and uh, I, I gave him a list to many places that I want to see. First of all, the place where I born because I born at home, my home, uh, the, the the synagogue. Uh, the uh, uh, the beach, of course, the school the, of the priest, and also in Tripoli, uh, he sent me someone called Muhammad Tarnish uh, that unfortunately passed away. Big expert of uh, every single, you know, he knew and remembers every single name of the families, the families living in the Hara in the uh, Jewish neighborhood, and uh, he was a fantastic man was so 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 sad that uh, he passed away just a year after we met and uh, he gave me a sort of tour of the Hara, Hara Kbira, Hara Zaira, they call it the, the big part of the quarter, the small part. There is also, I, I, there, there, there in Tripoli, there is also Hara Lwostia, the, the central one. Uh, perhaps uh, the people of Kupan um, And uh, I've been treated like a pope. And uh, more and more the surprise uh, became big when uh, after I came back, two weeks after, I received the same call, like copy pass, the same phone call from the Libyan ambassador asking me again the same thing, that you have to come here invited by Gaddafi. I thought that the bureaucracy in Libya are working bad. So I told them, listen, this is deja vu. So no, 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 you know, the 1st of September there is, what they call it the independence, the day of the, the Gaddafi came to power. And he wants you to come as a guest of honor. And I've been there and uh, since then that I have a problem to convince my friends, Libyan friends, that I didn't make any special prayer because after I've been there, they say, our mother, Jari Houdi, Gaddafi Gitlu. The first time the, the Jew came to uh, uh, the Dippinus Day, after a few months, Gaddafi has been killed. And uh, 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 he, man, we had five, six minutes meeting, uh, also historical one, and he agreed to everything I asked. And that's several things that uh, is not for this uh, interview, but uh, he, uh, he agreed to everything. 
and uh, now I'm trying to re report this uh, the verbal agreements again with the, the new government. Lucky, as I said, that the, 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 this new prime minister is a close friend of mine, and his brother was a very powerful minister during Gaddafi. And the family is a very young family, uh, multi-millionaire, and uh, very strong. Uh, uh, very, very known. And uh, the uh, brother, until uh, a few months ago, I knew that uh, had a, a sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it, mandate of capture by Interpol because uh, of crimes, war crimes or crimes against humanity. But uh, the, 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 the brother, the actual prime minister, totally different, totally different, very nice man. And uh, I'm very excited. I would like to tell you more things, but uh, it's better not at the moment. I hope to bring you very nice, very nice, very historical things that is cooking. And hopefully in a couple of months, uh, everyone will know it. Of course. You described yourself as a man who talks and, and I know you've, Having heard your interview, there are a lot of occasions where this has kind of helped you when you met the Pope. At one point you were kidnapped, which maybe we can talk about a bit uh, afterwards in the other questions. But I want to ask you, what's your, for you, what are you most proud of? What's your greatest achievement in all of the interfaith work that you've done? Uh, first of all, I'm proud of the thing that I all never felt minor in front of the Pope, in front of the Dalai Lama, that I managed to bring him in Israel, in Israel, uh, or the ministers. I'm usually sp speaking and talk with them as a human being to human being. And this is, I think it works. It works because the, 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 the VIP in front of me didn't feel that I'm coming there to, you know, with the tongue outside. And uh, uh, I think this is, I'm proud of this. And also the result uh, giving me a reason because uh, whilst I'll uh, treat them in the, in the normal human way, let's call it, so they agreed to come. I'm very proud that uh, uh, in Rhodos, uh, three years ago, I uh, managed to bring under the same roof four or three ministers, Israeli ministers, all Libyan origin, the deputy chairman of the Knesset, speaker of the Knesset, one general of the Israeli army, together with the uh, uh, Minister of Libya uh, from Iraq, thanks to the friend uh, Edwin, that he brought several uh, personalities from Iraq, from uh, the lead, one of the leaders of the Yazidi, and uh, so on. Um, you know, people were there drinking together, dancing together, uh, whoever wants on YouTube, there is the whole film. And uh, this is, of course, uh, it's not one main show. Uh, I managed to, uh, to do this kind of song because of the help of many friends. Uh, uh, again, I'm quoting Edwin uh, Shuker and other people. But uh, 10 days before, we I made the uh, organizers for the 40s of the expulsion. We also had the Prime Minister of Italy coming, especially from Rome, and uh, Sir uh, Gilbert. Um, uh, don't remember their first name. Martin Gilbert, yes, and uh, other personalities from Libya. Uh, it was the first time in the history that Gaddafi sent an official delegation, uh, led by the general director of the cultural uh, minister, that he read there a message from Gaddafi where he called us, Jews of Libya, you are um, uh, son of this country, mentioning Libya. And th this is our historical uh, achievement. And again, unfortunately, the Nemo, and I will say in Latin, Nemo Prophet and Patria. Nobody is, uh, is prophet in his uh, own uh, uh, city, on his, his place. And the people that are skeptic, and there are uh, uh, they're not so believers in this kind of activities, they are ours. I know for sure uh, that uh, people very active like me in their country, Iraq, like Edwin, had also the same problem. I know people from Egypt, I know Jews from uh, Tunisia, they say, our problem is uh, <laughs> to convince our people that we are doing something for the next generation. Because uh, 
it's impossible to leave, say, no, no, Libya, forget it. No, we cannot forget 2,400 years that the Jews were there. Again, the 5th of June, 67, all in Tripoli, we left 37 synagogues, plus the, 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 the small countries, Homs, uh, Haryan, uh, Musrata, Sirte, uh, Benghazi, of course, uh, and the, the people and the um, uh, towns near Benghazi, like uh, Marj, like Darna, uh, Tobruk. Um, I mean, there's a huge history. Why has to be neglected? Uh, yeah, at Safadi Voices, we agree with that. I think we're always, <laughs> well, our main, you know, aim is to kind of preserve these stories and make sure they're not forget forgotten. Um, so I want to thank you very much. I think it's a lovely message for today, especially the idea of talking and, you know, interfaith dialogue. I think it's very, very important. So I want to thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to open the, because we haven't got much time, open two questions from uh, everyone here. But before that, I've just got one question that was sent in in advance. So yeah. I'm going to ask that to you first. Um, so it's uh, from, are there any Jewish Libyan children stories? Would people have told tales of Joha or is there specific things to Libyan Jews? You have to, uh, I, didn't, I didn't catch the... Sorry, I have to read it, that's why I have to. So, are there any specific Jewish Libyan stories? Were people telling tales of Joha or are there any specific stories for Libyan Jews? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, our time, we're not on uh, internet, we're not uh, television, we're not nothing. The only thing was the radios. And uh, once, uh, especially in the two, three um, winter months, uh, we children, we lived on this kind of stories. So, Joha, we call it Shah, and uh, other uh, invented uh, um, people and uh, sometimes uh, you know my uh, father used to uh, to say the same jokes to Italians and I noticed that nobody nobody laughs so I told him Abba we it's our humor it's not their humor you cannot ask, uh, ask uh, tell a Joha uh, story to a non a non Jew non Sephardi Jew pretending that he understands you cannot understand and uh, yes, we had this a lot of stories. Uh, also, we I know I know that we we were, were uh, very uh, I mean, especially the children in Benghazi like to uh, tell each other, maybe we even invented story of horror, of scary stories, you know, like <laughs> brown stories, scary stories. And uh, but we lived mo much more on the holy text. So I remember that the school we. Every single year we used to, uh, every class uh, present uh, uh, Joseph and his brothers, uh, a comedy, you know, uh, done in school, or Moshe Rabbeinu, or Esther, of course, and Mordecai, and all the, all the, all the masks, all the things. This is, was very popular there, to represent uh, episodes of the Bible uh, in school. Thank you. So now I'm going to open up the floor if anyone has uh, any questions? Can't... You're a professional, everyone knows everything. Everyone. <laughs> okay. you, so... should read, you should read, there are, I think, uh, some people that wrote in the chat. Yes, yeah. so, so uh, Gina Waldman, I can't. Gina Waldman says, so thank you, uh, Mr. Luzon. Rest assured, our organization, Jimena, continues to tell the story of Jewish voices. Yeah, first of all, let me say hello to my friend, a very close friend, Gina Waldman. Uh, she may be too shy to, to show her face, but she is there. And uh, Gina is doing a, a terrific uh, work in the uh, United States. In, uh, in Los Angeles, and the last uh, three four years we start to operate together very close. And more and more, we have tomorrow, tomorrow don't forget, Gina, we have tomorrow uh, an appointment, telephone appointment to organize some 
uh, takes together. And uh, that was also a very nice work. And uh, the thing that I'm always pushing and pushing, all this organization where there are three Jews, there are four organizations, but there are three Sephardi Jews, there are six organizations. So to unite, to reunite, and to be strong all together, not to, uh, where everyone under the same umbrella can develop their specification. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, we have in the Libyan Jewry uh, now a sort of uh, a renaissance. People that until now, uh, Rafael of Allah and myself, we used to, to really to, to pray, to beg, come and help us. They thought only about business. And now suddenly, uh, by retired people, uh, they discovered Libya. So we have Amos Guetta, that is now specification, is the, is the Libyan cuisine, and uh, Jerby, that is a psychologist, about uh, the, the effect that had the, the, the pogrom on uh, our people, on, on their people also. Uh, myself, uh, uh, that is not from today. Uh, and Gina, like me, is not uh, a new arrival, a new nouveau riche. Uh, but around the last 40 years that she's acting very strong and uh, she appeared also on the United Nations uh, with the Libyan West, the Libyan traditional West. It was very good. And uh, uh, when you asked me at the beginning, well, I'm proud, I'm proud that I force, uh, quote, quote, force the cardinals or the Dalai Lama Oh, by the way, he's a fantastic man, this Dalai Lama. Uh, you know, very high sense of humor, by the way. And uh, to speak about Jews from our country. Uh, when I say to someone, ambassador, uh, German ambassador in, uh, in uh, Tunisia, uh, I told him, listen, you know that there are 3,600 organizations in the United Nations that are dealing with Palestinian problems. There is only a sub-commission that dealing with the, the Jews from Arab country, and also the subcommission in meetings every one every five years. He was shocked. So this is the truth. You can check. So uh, Gina's also asked us, uh, we would just like to say that we are, uh, our archive is also available at Better Pusa in Tel Aviv, that Gina was asking, just to finish. And I'm going to pass now. Gina, can I just say, Gina, uh, welcome uh, and congratulations on the fantastic work of Jamena. And I have a question maybe for Rafael and for Gina um, and for anyone else who know. I, I'm interested in the German compensation. Was any compensation any, ever given to the Libyan survivors? Yes. Yes, there are some of you, you know, from uh, uh, 300 Jews, 100 from Benghazi, 200 from Tripoli, uh, has been taken to Bergen-Belsen. And the only a small uh, part of them came back. One of them was my, well, our neighbors, and I remember that I always used to ask him, what is this number having on the, on the arm? And only after I left Libya, someone explained to me what is it. And uh, also there are more, uh, more than 3,000 people that uh, has been deported in the uh, concentration camp of Jado, that is south of Libya, south of Tripoli. And uh, all these people have been recognized uh, to, that uh, they, uh, uh, they need to receive compensation. Part of them mostly uh, are receiving now from the, Israel, sorry, from the Israeli government, through the Israeli government compensation from Germany, part of them from Italy. And uh, believe it or not, there are part of them that uh, even haven't applied because of not knowing or uh, personally, I never, dealt with this uh, matter. I mean, you always dealt uh, on the Arab side of the compensation. Uh, you have something else, Gina, to say? Unmute Gina, please. Unmute. Yeah, she can unmute herself if you'd like to, Gina, you can. I get it, okay. All right, um, I just want to share, um, in addition to what uh, uh, Paulina said, is that uh, the one thing that Jimena uh, works on uh, diligently is the fact that there are a lot of issues that are not just the um, concentration camps, but other anti-Semitic issues that have taken place during the period of, uh, uh, you know, pro-Nazi regimes like the Farhud in Iraq, and 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 other other 
type of pogroms, but also um, the sad part, and we're making some um, some progress in that department, is that of most, if not almost all, uh, celebrations or rather memorials that take place on Yom HaShoah completely and totally erase our history of the Holocaust. So one of the issues here has to be that we have to knock at every museum, every Holocaust museum, every school and say, where is my story? Where is the story of our people? And um, Oh, uh, the um, German government, as you all know, has actually recognized the camps like Jado and others in North Africa as being part of the Nazi machine. But somehow uh, it's uh, relegated to e Europe and European Jewry having been persecuted by the Nazis in this, most of the concentration camps. Even y Yom Hash I mean, uh, Yad Vashem shows testimonials of Jews from North Africa, but they were transported. And as uh, Falino well explained, some of the people in Libya who were had a nationality, whether it was French or English, were transported to camps such as Auschwitz and Birkenau and so forth, but do not um, have hardly anything on um, the camp of Jado. Today at the uh, museum, uh, Jewish Museum of Libya, in Israel, they're holding, as we speak actually, they're holding um, a memorial service. And uh, I was, uh, I interviewed several members who had been in the camps. We have, I have relatives myself from Benghazi that uh, passed away. Um, one family that survived and their sisters passed away of typhus. So even though they didn't have um, the, these camps, and correct me, Failino, if I'm wrong, um, even if they didn't have crematoria per se, they actually, the conditions were so horrendous that people died of, for example, um, typhus and disease mm -hmm. and other conditions. And yet again, even most though- of the guys, Most of the people died from malaria, typhus, malaria, typhus. and the, the hygiene, scarf hygiene. Exactly. So uh, we need to we we need to uh, make a point to all of the different. Uh, there are curriculums that cover uh, Holocaust um, history in almost every school that we know of. Israel has to start doing that. Israel has to set the example. In fact, talking about Israel, one of the things that Jimena has been really pushing uh, with the Minister of Education is to create a curriculum which is practically non-existent. 51% of Jewish uh, Jews uh, are Mizrahi Jews, people like uh, Mr. Luzon and myself who live in Israel. And, and yet we have no history that is recorded in the curriculum of um, uh, the schools in Israel. And that is really uh, been the struggle of Jemena to try to get through. They've made some progress, but not enough. You know, I think we're fighting the same battle here in the UK. And I think it's very important that we have to talk to Holocaust Museum, not only on the Holocaust, on the history of, you know, Mizrahi uh, Sephardi Jews. Right. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you what I read uh, just recently, that one of the problems is that uh, there isn't so much documentation on those concentration camps like Jado, that it's all destroyed, that, you know, there is actually, in terms, there might be some testimonies, but there aren't many documents. Is that true? Uh, actually, uh, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Luzon has more to say about this. Uh, our experience has been that, uh, first of all, um, when the, the Shoah Foundation started with uh, Spielberg, yeah. they, they did not make any effort whatsoever uh, to, to interview people from our background. And that could have, now that we've lost most of them, it, it, that's why what the uh, Sephardic Voices UK is so important is because you're trying to capture a story before we die, okay? And and the story of the Jews that were in the camps were not adequately captured, mm -hmm. and um, and so um, what better documentation was there than the fact that the person experienced and talks about what they suffered and how they did it? Uh, surely not all the uh, Jews of Poland or, or, or um, you know, any other place 
didn't walk around with documentation about what happened to them. So I think the human story was in itself a documentation and that was not captured. There's something else. Correct. There is a, a, a booklet of 100 pages called Tumunat uh, Zikaron that is uh, full of testimonies as uh, edited by Or Shalom uh, Center and uh, was been written by Dr. Nitsa Tukman and uh, it's a fantastic book. You can ask it to Or Shalom and I think we can send it to you free of charge and uh, contain uh, hundreds of testimonies about what happened in these camps. As Regina said, it doesn't matter if it was not a, a, a phone or insulator, but uh, they died not less between because of malaria and typhus and the very bad condition and the violent uh, behavior of the, the people there, mainly Italian fascists. There is another book, if I, I may, also uh, by Yossi Sukari, uh, yeah. who, uh, who has also documented a lot of this. So oh. again, uh, since it's wonderful that you're recording this, uh, this uh, session, because I'd love to have uh, to, to, you know, uh, forward it to many of our members. So where yeah, is the biggest testimony collection in terms of Libyan Jews? Where, where would it be accessible? Accessible in two main places. Uh, let's say two main places are in uh, Merkaz or Shalom in uh, Bethlehem. Uh, the director is Pedi Beratia, and uh, the, what they call it, the uh, World Organization of Jews of Libya in Or Yehuda. They have also a museum and a huge uh, material. Of course, in uh, our uh, small private museum, also Gina and myself, we have a huge amount of, uh, of uh, documentaries of. Uh, uh, archives of uh, things that uh, has to be valorized and uh, to be even donated to one of the two museums. Uh, the problem is that uh, I would have to find a way not to be enemy of the other museum or to divide it between the two or we have to find a way. And also I have some big uh, material that I've been uh, given by uh, after the death of the uh, Rafael of Allah, the of Allah, and that I would like that I promise that I am to pass to any museum of the of all, all Libyan Jew, all Libyan or uh, Jew from Arab countries. So this this are the four main uh, sources. Thank you, thank you, Rafael. Thank you. Um, I think we'll end it there because I know people want to. Uh, be ready for the 7.30 big event, your Mashua uh, online event. So um, I just wanted to say thank you very, very much uh, to Raphael. Um, and yeah, thank you very, very much for joining us. Our pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You thank you, Daisy.